and we are recording. Welcome, boys and girls, cats and dogs. We are an inclusive channel here, and um, um, we have the honor of having as our guest Joe Wilcox, who was the coordinator of the retreat I went to recently, and indeed of uh, all of the um, men's knitting, which should be fiber retreats. Is that correct? Kind of. Um, I, I actually, there's kind of two levels of the organization. So actually, Aaron was the coordinator of the retreat you went to. Um, I was the co-coordinator and uh, the May retreat I coordinate and coordinates, it co-coordinates that one. And the other ones, the other regional ones are coordinated individually by regional coordinators, volunteer coordinators. And um, I just kind of do sort of an umbrella organization, like I maintain the website and help them out with registration forms and stuff like that. Cool, cool. Well, um, tell us more about yourself. I'd be glad to. My name is Joe Wilcox. Um, I've been known in the fiber community for decades now, actually, as Queer Joe. Um, I, I've had a blog since uh, early 2000s, and um, I've also, uh, like you just mentioned, uh, started organizing men's fiber retreats. Um, they really should have been called men's fiber retreats or something more generic. Uh, you're absolutely right about that. When we first put them together, we didn't, we weren't very forward thinking in terms of what we wanted to include in that particular population of guys. So unfortunately we- Well, in all fairness, there are more knitters than there are crocheters. I, I don't know if that's true plan, uh, uh, you know, in the planet, but uh, we'd certainly have no problem if any of the retreats had more crocheters than knitters, for instance, because mm -hmm. it really is about the men's fiber community. We just happened to have bought the domain name for men's knitting retreat.com. So <laughs> we were kind of stuck with it after a while. So, but um, I've also, um, I also um, have been knitting for about 35 years. Um, I do crochet as well. I've done some weaving, I've done some quilting, I've done some, uh, I've done a lot of spinning. I do some spinning as well. So I'm kind of like all around fiber guy myself. So you would have thought that I would have included that as the name, but. Oh, so well. you're pretty wanton, uh, Yarny, then, aren't you? I, I consider myself a fiber whore, yes. <laughs> I like that, that's cool. So um, now um, at the show and tell that we had at the retreat, you showed us some beautiful things. Um, so you wanna show us some of the things you have? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Um, actually, the. The best one I think I had at the retreat was something, a uh, recent design that I've done. It's this huge shawl, um, and even that's in half. So it's this like incredibly wide and long shawl. Um, sorry, I can't even put the whole thing in there. And it's got this kind of odd shaping at the bottom. I ended up calling it the liquefied shawl, the striping kind of melts into this uh, liquefied version when you can look at it from a hole. And um, it's basically all just garter stitch in stripes, but um, it happened to include some of the colorways of the logo that our retreat venue uses, that purple and green color. Oh, that's right. The standard, uh -huh. you can kind of see the liquef liquefaction piece of it from this view, I guess. Cool, cool. I'm actually known though for like my signature one of my signature designs is something I call the knitted cross stitch scarf. It's kind of a, a mesh. Um, um, it's not quite cables, but you can kind of see how yeah. you know, the stitches cross over. And it, one of the things that I was looking for early on was a way to use variegated yarns. I fell in love with Koigu as a, as a yarn company and they have very fine uh, short, dye uh, variegated yarns and um, I really love their yarns but most of the designs that they have for them I thought were awful they did they basically did stock and knit designs which pooled and and striped these variegated yarns in a really bad way I thought and so I wanted to come up with something that would kind of blend them in a way that was pleasing and this particular design does that really well for both self-patterning yarns and for variegated yarns so um, I thought that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I was just looking at that on your Ravelry, um, uh, pay, your um, rather uh, Instagram page, um, and um, and you have that one on Ravelry, right? 
I do. Um, I, I actually design under the name Double Pointed Designs, um, and that's kind of my craft show uh, uh, name as well. So Double Pointed Designs, if you, and that's double pointed one word. If you look that up on Ravelry, you'll see um, I probably have about 20 designs out there currently. And uh, most of them I put out there because people wanted them. I, I don't, I, trust me, I do not make a living on selling patterns. I just. Uh, oh, this I have fun. I, I I was amazed. I was shocked to hear that one of the more popular designs last year made enough money for somebody, some guy, to pay off his student loans, and and I'm talking like tens of thousands of dollars. So, I, I was shocked that somebody could sell that many patterns, and you know, and it wasn't Stephen West. It was somebody, you know, like whatever. His pattern was beautiful and deserved to have that kind of fame, but. I was shocked that people sold that many patterns ever. <laughs> so, I, I think my best month on Ravelry was something like 118 bucks. <laughs> and and I've, as of this week, I've got 24 patterns up there. And I do have uh, to say you've done better than I ever have. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because I push all of my YouTube followers hard. <laughs> I'm hey. always saying, Daddy needs pattern sales. That's the thing I've always decided that uh, since I've been blogging for so long and, and I have a YouTube channel as well and uh, stuff like that, I don't try to monetize it except to pay for the cost of my web service, my web hosting and for my domain name, which is basically about $200 a year. So if I make $200 a year on patterns, I consider it a, uh, you know, I'm even at that point. One of the other, in fact, one of the other patterns that you'll see out there is a crochet pattern. In fact, I just cast out, or I just did a chain of uh, 414 stitches for uh, what I call my uh, uh, interlocking crochet scarf. It's a, uh, it's this mesh pattern. It's basically two, uh, or it's basically um, stripes of. Um, Kind of like boxcar chains of of stitches that are interlocked into each other to create this oh, old like mesh, sort of, a lattice kind of thing. It is exactly it, it, yeah. It's a four by four ladder type of chain when it's when one is done and when the second one is done, you kind of interlock each one of those ladders into each other, and so it's got this really cool interlocking mesh. But the reason I mention that is because my my YouTube channel also isn't that popular and um and i went and looked and i was trying to see you know, like the statistics and you know i have like 115 views on one video or i have like five views on another video type of thing but then i have eighty-five thousand views on this one interlocking crochet, interlocking <laughs> crochet uh, tutorial that i did wow you crocheters are crazy oh my god the the I couldn't believe that it had 85,000 views. It was like shocking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, well, do you know, um, the most popular crochet channel I know, she has more um, subscribers than Las Vegas has residents. Can you believe that? I can actually, because like I said, you crochet people are like- Crazy, yeah. <laughs> no, you're really good at it. You know, it's like, um, <clears throat> You're really good at making names for yourselves and and promoting yourselves much better than I ever have been. So it's it's awesome. I think it's great. Well, I'm trying. My actually, my one year anniversary comes up this month. Oh, geez, so. you're huge if in one year. That's incredible. Oh, I don't know that I'm huge except my butt. But um, um, I so you last week. It's not that huge. <laughs> <laughs> I um. You mentioned uh, one yarn manufacturer. Um, uh, who are your favorites? Oh, um, these days I'm loving Unique Yarns. I think Unique Yarns, and that's Earth, uh, I'm sorry, it's Earth Yarns. Um, they put out a line of yarn called Unique, and both of them are spelled differently than I'm saying it. So Earth is U-R-T-H, and Unique is U-N-E-E-K. Um, uh, they have this, uh, in fact, I just, uh, that chain I was showing you was uh, uh, a unique fingering yarn. Um, and one of the things I love about it, and I can't show it to you here, but um, the striping, it's long, it's long, long dyla, so it stri self stripes, but it self stripes with interlocking colors. So for instance, this, this blue will be interlocked with the, 
with the red and then it will the blue will switch to green and the red will switch to purple or something like that and, and the way that they're interlocked is very different than any other dyeing i've seen i particularly like cool yeah. fine colors and so i'm really a big, huge fan of unique urines i've also um i i should mention that my one of the current projects i'm working on is uh rowan designed by martin story it's going to be a cowl it's called the shoal uh, shoal cowl and uh, actually, because of the fish, fish, yeah. And so, eventually, it will hopefully look like this. Oh, well, that's cool. And if uh, you wear it, do you get to look like that guy? <laughs> um, all I care is that this guy comes and thanks me for making it. That's all <laughs> so. Um, uh, when we're done here, uh, I would love for you to send me a list of all of your links and any pictures you'd also like me to include. And um, if you um, want to uh, take the trouble, also any of the um, yarn people that you talk about. That'd be awesome. Thank you. Yeah. When, when we were at the, at the retreat, that show and tell night, it just blew me away, the amazing talent. But also, people... We're talking about these really luxurious hand-dyed yarns. And I stood up in my sweater and I said, this came from Dollar Tree. <laughs> and I was proud of it. It was $17 worth of yarn. And you should be proud of it. One of the things that, so since I sell some of my knitted objects and crocheted stuff, um, I have to get a certain price point. And so you can't, you can't pay $35 for a hank of fingering weight yarn and expect to make, you know, $100 on the finished scarf. Uh, well, you can. Some people do, but I, I can't. I can't get that price from the craft shows that I go to. And I go to pretty high-end craft shows. But still, people aren't going to look at a very beautiful, colorful scarf and say, yeah, I'm willing to pay $100 for that. And uh, so most of my yarns, I either have to get on sale or um, even if they're nice, get them on sale um, and or buy less expensive stuff that people aren't uh, people would be willing to pay for the end price after labor. And stuff. Yeah. So. The, the gift bag that the retreat participants got had some really nice yarn in it. And then I bought too much yarn that weekend also on <laughs> top of that. Yeah, I spent too much money. Um, but um, I will enjoy using that yarn. Some of it I gave away too, because I have some very generous friends. And so I want to give some back. That's but, awesome. um, we were very fortunate. We had um, Sirdar, um, somebody who reps for Sirdar gave us a, each a ball of beautiful yarn. That was the acrylic one, so the less expensive one. Um, that same rep also gave us a hat kit for rowan yarn with a rowan yarn in it that I thought was beautiful and alpaca yarn. And um, and then one of the guys whose yarn store is growing out of business up in Provincetown ended up giving each of us a, just a, a very expensive hanker ball of yarn. Um, they were all different. So Oh, I yeah. I liked the hank that I got. It was um, um, very nice. And the only reason I know it's really nice is because I ended up um, with his hank of sock yarn. I ended up cranking out a pair of socks on the circular sock knitting machine for him. And oh my God, they turned out absolutely beautiful. Mm. Three pair of socks. They were incredible. Wonderful. I haven't, I haven't decided what to do with any of the yarn that I brought back with me yet. Cause I've, I already had a bunch in my stash, but um, anyway, um, so let's talk more about the retreats. How long have they been going on? Thanks. Yeah, the retreats have been going on since 2008. Um, it, actually, around 2006, I think it was, I had a friend. I was working up in Albany on a long-term project, and I lived down in um, the eastern Pennsylvania and the Delaware River, almost in New Jersey. And um, But my, I had a long-term project up in Albany, which is about three and a half hours away from here. And uh, um, I had to work a weekend one time and I met somebody up there and he said, well, I work at this retreat center. Why don't you come and visit? So I said, great. And uh, so I went for a, a community barbecue that they had. And uh, he said, um, I, oh, my God, I had trouble finding the place. But once I did, it was 
gorgeous. It was so beautiful. And I was really, I, I was just like, I need to come back here somehow. Fast forward a little bit. I was at Rhinebeck and Ted Myatt, uh, who's been around in virtual uh, fiber circles for decades from up in Ontario in Canada, he um, he was at Rhinebeck as well. And we were chatting and he says, oh, I was just down in your neighborhood um, where you're working. He says, I was at this place called Easton Mountain. I said, oh my God, I was just there like a few months ago. And he was there for a separate retreat type of thing. And uh, he said, wouldn't it be amazing to like see men, you know, like knitting and crocheting all up and down that mountain? And I was like, oh my God, it would. <laughs> I said, I need to make this. He said, I'd love to do it myself. He says, but as a Canadian, I don't want to organize something in the States, especially if I'm, you know, for whatever reason, I'm not able to do it. And uh, so I said, as we saw this time. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so I said, say no more. I, I am on it. <laughs> And so we ended up calling up East and Mountain. We said, you know, we'd like this is what we'd like to do. And uh, we'd like to have guys come and, uh, you know, do a knitting retreat of some sort. And he said, the guy says, great. Let's see. How would the third weekend in May be? And I said, perfect. Three days, two nights. And uh, I don't remember how much it costs, but they did, they did all the administration of it. East and Mountain did for us that first retreat. And... Um, he said, how many people do you think will be there? And I asked Ted and Ted said, you know, five or six. And I said, nah, it's probably going to be eight or 12. Both of us had blogs at the time and we figured we had a channel for marketing it a little bit. And uh, so I said, probably a dozen. And so max. And so they said, great. Uh, we've got two other things going on that weekend. We'll just fit you in. So perfect. So we advertise it. Two weeks later, they call me up. Eastern Mountain calls me up in a panic. They're like, you need to tell these people to stop calling. I said, what do you mean? He said, we have 25 guys registered. For the retreat. I said, 25 guys? He says, yeah. And I was like, oh, um, just start putting them on a waiting list then, I guess. Like, what do you do when you fill up a retreat? I don't know what to tell you. Sorry. Wow. And well, it turns out that they ended up canceling. Um, it, they actually had three other retreats scheduled originally that weekend. And they canceled two of them, and they still had the other one. We ended up having 32 guys at that first retreat. And um, I, and we had it along with the Aging Gay Men was the name of the other group. Oh, there. and they were Sage? Of, no, it wasn't part of Sage, although a lot of them were Sage members. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were fascinated by us. And they were delightful, delightful. Mm -hmm. God. And uh, they insisted on, uh, they asked us if they could be there for our show and tell. And we were like, of course. And they were, uh, like you were talking about, astounded by the level of expertise of some of these guys. Anyway, we realized that this was going to become a big thing. And so we ended up, every year from then on, we just uh, started renting out the entire facility and um, uh, and just organizing ourselves and administering it ourselves. And for the 14 years we've been doing it, um, it got so difficult to um, do registration for the May retreat that we finally decided, because it was filling up within minutes, literally, every time we'd open up registration, that we decided to open up the second retreat in September that was coincident with the Adirondack Fiber Festival. And, um, and that one's turned out to be incredibly popular as well, as you, which is the one, obviously, you went to. Um, but May still fills up like in under 10 minutes and uh so it, it, even having that overflow going into september type of thing didn't help that much and we've got pretty much our regulars that go to may and our regulars go to september now and uh it's turned into just an amazing group of guys one of the things i, I just want to say one other thing about the retreats uh, unless you have other questions but one of the things that i'm amazed at it, it like after the first year when this magical group of 32 guys showed up we were like, holy shit, these guys are amazing. And, like they were supportive and loving and awesome, awesome guys. And so we were like, what happens next year when a bunch of like idiots show up? You know, <laughs> everything, right? We were really concerned. And so when we had 40 guys register the next year, actually, it was probably 43, I think, the second year, um, we were like, Every one of them shut up was the exact same as the first year. Some of them were the same guys, obviously, but um, 
it was just another amazing group of guys. And every year that same magic, some, somehow the self-selection process of bringing people to this retreat attracts just, just an amazing caliber of guys. And, <laughs> and I think you experience that same level of. God, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, I'll confess it, it, for me, um, it was the first time I'd been around that many men, most of them gay, um, um, in a long, long time. And I had my moments when it felt like junior high school, but I, that was all me and not anyone else. Um, mm. And um, everyone was, you know, very nice. I, and of course, Easton itself, uh, because of the nature of the retreats that they do there, I told you about the, um, the Gay Men's Labor Day retreat I used to go to regularly and that retreat no longer uh, exists um, in the form that I knew it. I don't know what's going on now. Um, it was the same thing. I mean, of course there are personalities, but um, yeah, I have no complaints about anything except for those hills. <laughs> you mean I, was, I was telling someone that I think in the year since I have been there, the hills got steeper. It, it, so what what he's talking about is the from the main building where we do most of our activities up to the housing lodge, which is <laughs> an old two story vintage like building. They have there's a rather it's not just a steep hill; it's also ruddy and filled with roots and rocks and stones jutting out. And uh, it is especially at night when you're going back to your room after a long day of really chatting and socializing and knitting and crocheting and such. It, it, can be a, a challenge. Yeah. I, actually, I, I called it a successful weekend because I never once fell on my face. I, and I'm glad you didn't do that again after. <laughs> I, I, kept, I kept having to tell people, it's like, that bruise on his face, we did not do that. We don't do that. <laughs> yes, exactly. Although I got some really interesting ideas for stories to tell from some of the other guys. Um, What's One of the Steves point? actually suggested that I say that I was attacked by ninjas in Joanne's parking lot. I, it, ideal. I, that sounds ideal. I, I have to say, having had poison ivy one July 4th on my face, um, I, it, when you have such a visible thing uh, on your face, everybody asks you, you know, what happened? And it's like, how many times do you have to tell the story of what happened? Especially then, it was so non-eventful. You know, it was such a non-thing. And after a while, you forget it's there, but everybody still notices it. Exactly right. Yeah, but yeah, I had fun with it. Not in the moment, not when it happened. Yeah, I could bet. But, um, um, but I had fun with it afterwards. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it was a great retreat. Um, I'm going to the Southeast retreat in November. Um, so um, can't buy any yard back. I, I do have to say that's one retreat I've never, one regional retreat I've never been to, although I, Rusty, the guy who coordinates that, he's been at the retreat. There's a guy who's helped him in the past, this guy Curtis, who usually goes to the retreat. I don't think he's going this year. He's right? not going this year. I've interviewed them both, actually, for this channel. Oh, gotcha. Curtis is yeah. awesome. Oh, well, Rusty is awesome, too. So Yeah, they both are. They both are. I would love to meet Curtis, but um, not this year, apparently. Curtis Unless I... Hmm? Curtis actually comes up and visits people in my hometown of New Hope, Pennsylvania. And uh, he did that a few weeks ago. It, it oh, nice. Shortly before the retreat. He says, let's get together. I said, okay. He says, do you know, I forget the, his friend's name. Do you know Dave and Bob? And I said, no. I, I said, I don't know anybody in my town. It's, it's pathetic. And so anyway, Dave and Bob dropped him off at the yarn store. We sat and chatted and bought some yarn. And, and I said, um, where are you staying, by the way? Uh, I said, maybe I could drop you off instead of them having to come all the way out here and pick you up. And he says, oh, in this little development called Fieldstone. I said, really? I said, that's where I live. He goes, and you don't know Dave and Bob? And I said, no, I don't. <laughs> I'm so, I, as social as you know I am, I am not like neighborly social. And uh, so I don't know any of my neighbors. It's really awful. 
And uh, so I said, I'll, I'll bring you back as long as you have the address, I can get you there. It turns out literally I can see, I live in a townhouse complex. I can literally see their house from my front door. That's how close they live. And I still didn't know. Mm. So anyway, Curtis is a great guy. It was great. Fun yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah. So I'm looking forward to, um, you know, meeting the other people who go there. Um, I, I spoke to a guy yesterday who's going to be um, going to post his interview this Monday. He'll be the following Monday. Um, and um, he, I think he's been to the Southeast retreat. I don't know that he's been to the Northeast. He knows of you, but I don't think you've ever met. Um, so I'm sure you have friends in common. But he, there's also um, another event in Asheville, um, the city uh, near where the uh, Southeast Retreat is, um, in a week or two, which is a, another yarn festival. And had I known, I still wouldn't have been able to go because I have no money after that retreat. <laughs> but um, uh, it, it would have been fun to go. But um, yeah, yeah. And that was my very first fiber retreat. Oh, that's fantastic. So yeah, that was a good experience. I would love to um, go back every year. Um, I won't even try to get into the South, to the spring retreat, because since you say they go so fast. It does. Um, I mean, people sit at their computers refreshing the page, like second by second for 10 minutes before it opens. And uh, and are signed into PayPal already just to make sure that it's all ready to go. It's crazy how how fast it goes. It's 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 exciting and it's really great from an administrative perspective, but it's really awful from an expectation setting perspective because there were people that are like, "Oh, I tried. I couldn't get in." It's like I I feel like I say I'm sorry a thousand times after every registration goes through, but. Uh, it is what it is. So. Hmm. And you really can't go to a larger venue. And yeah. if Easton expanded, it would change the character of the place. So, so you're sort of between a rock and a hard place. So, so yes, we could go to a different venue, um, but I really like Easton Mountain. Oh, we yeah. Could, we could actually go up to probably about 50 guys we really wanted to at Easton Mountain. I, I think the largest retreat we ever did up there was 48 guys. And um, uh, they've changed housing configuration a little bit, but um, but we could still probably do 50 if we really, if we did camping and tents and, and various other housing options. Um, yeah. But when I, was, I, yeah, when I was going to the Labor Day retreats, the, um, it was always, almost always still warm and people would, uh, a lot of people would camp. Hey, well, camping, I, I, I've been considering um, offering a couple of camping options at the May retreat in, just so that we can keep prices down and still, we, we basically, uh, from a financial perspective, uh, have to rent out it, a minimum of 40 beds from Eastern Mountain and 40 guys. Um, anything over that, we pay the, the standard rate for everyone over it, but every under it, we lose that money if we don't register at least 40 guys, right? 38 is kind of my ideal number uh, in terms of, it, it, it works the best in terms of the total number of guys. Um, so I prefer to actually have 38 guys in essence pay for 40 spots. And so it makes it a little bit more expensive, but it's still, it's still, I personally yeah. think affordable and, and in total, but other people have concerns. But we also have scholarship. And so. Yeah, I yeah I I understand where you're coming from, but as a first timer, I have to say I was very comfortable with the numbers that were there this year, even though they were down. And I know that um, it was bad financially for the organization because the numbers were down. Well, we're <laughs> we like to call ourselves a not for profit hopefully not for loss <laughs> type of type of event mm -hmm. and uh, and typically that's been the case i i mean we anyway uh but um i have to say having we had 29 guys at the retreat this uh this past week uh, this last month and um 
it was ideal. It was so awesome that you could get to know everybody, you could connect, you could uh, really get to know people, basically. And I really loved it. But you can do the same thing with up to 38 guys, I found. Um, it goes over 38, it's a little bit more difficult. And um, But 38 is still incredibly manageable. The, you know, tables at dinner and stuff are much more interesting when it's a little bit bigger than it was when you saw it. Anyway, I, I've got a lot of experience in terms of the numbers <laughs> at this point. 47 is is ridiculously too many, and uh, and I, I thought 28 was like the minimum that we could have gone and still had a really thriving community with uh, within the guys. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So I think that um, I think that Southeast is going to be smaller. Um, um, while I was there, I got an email from Rusty um, saying that because of the, the numbers, it was still full. I, I sort of misunderstood the, the email because I think I said at one time there might be some spaces available, but um, but he was able to put everyone in a private room, which was good. I paid for a private room for that. <laughs> but uh, um, it was, um, I'm looking forward to it, just um, for the program stuff. Um, so um, what else shall we talk about? Um, now, um, how about your, your um, social media presence? You, you've talked a little bit about it. Um, you, you say you have a blog and um, Instagram as well and uh, Ravelry, of course. Um, and of course, um, the um, knitting organization the retreat organization has a um, its own website and uh, Facebook pages, and all of that stuff. Yeah. So, so from a social media perspective, it started out years ago. I was on the knit list, and if you remember, I, you probably don't know about the knit list, but it was a um, an internet email forum type of thing where you get a um, either individual or a bunch of emails that people had sent into the forum and uh it was this highly contentious crazy group of uh fiber enthusiasts and uh, some were you know ultra conservative and religious and others were like liberal and oh uh, it's just this crazy crazy place so with like people trying to establish rules uh, on the internet and stuff way back then it was just nuts um but um there were two people that I knew who were writing knitting blogs. One was uh, Wendy Johnson. She wrote WendyKnits.net. It was it used to be her blog. I think it still is actually. Um, Wendy used to knit like a Fair Isle sweater every week and post it, post photos. And she had an amazingly popular blog, um, but it was really kind of dreary. Uh, like it, people would write in comments. Like she'd get. 70 comments every time she posts a blog entry and every one of them would be like beautiful sweater oh that's just gorgeous stunning sweater love the colors in the sweater the co oh wendy that color that sweater it was like everyone why bother reading the comments i i you did you didn't after a while they they didn't forward the conversation at all it, it was only fawning and and rightfully so her sweaters were gorgeous but if but if it didn't say something like, um, oh my God, did you actually steek that neck? That makes it even more amazing, or something like that. It adds something interesting to your comment. It, it yeah, was, I, I, I would think technical questions would be a lot more interesting. I, I found her, her blog to start getting almost sterile in terms of the routine of it and the rhythm of it and stuff like that. On, yeah. the other, on the other side of the spectrum was Marilyn Roberts. Marilyn Roberts was known in the knitting community as the knitting curmudgeon. She had this snarky, uh, take no prisoners, like. I think I love her. <laughs> oh, you would have loved Meryl. And Meryl actually died a few years ago. Oh, and, dear. Um, after having blogged for years. Um, but I definitely wanted my blog to be as interesting and maybe not quite so snarky as Marilyn's, but, uh, but I definitely wanted it to be interesting. And so when I first started my blog years ago, I actually had rules for reading my blog uh, that you had to follow. And it was rules for commenting, really, or rules for participating. So if you wanted to participate in my blog, you couldn't leave a comment that was just 
sterile. It, you couldn't say, um, I agree, Joe, or beautiful work, Joe, or whatever. You, you had to you had to forward the conversation with your comment if you were going to leave one at all. And I didn't care whether you left or not. You could constantly just read my blog and never comment. I was fine with that. But I insisted that if you're going to participate, you couldn't do it in a lazy way. You couldn't just lazily say, I'm here too. You know, it's like you need to add something to the conversation. <laughs> oh, my God. I pissed off so many people with those rules. <laughs> they were like infuriated. With it. And so I was like, I, oh, they were infuriated. They were like, I, I threatened them. I said, if you leave a comment that says that sweater is beautiful, I will say, and my husband got hard just looking at it. I will change your comment to make it like lewd and and lascivious because you were too lazy to leave a real comment. And uh, because I had the ability back then to actually edit people's comments. <laughs> I do now too. It's, it's gone back to where I can actually edit people's comments. Mm. Mm. No, I never did actually edit anybody's comments, um, but the people who were, they were like, I will never read this blog. I was like, great, thank you, bye. You know, I was like, I didn't care. I wasn't in it for the hits. Yeah, I, yeah. I really was doing it for myself. And at uh, any rate, and, and then it uh, parlayed, and then when uh, Ravelry started coming out and, so, and uh, Facebook did, I started getting presence on there and basically marketing my blog through that. And again, it's not really monetized, so it's not like I quote, market anything. Um, but I certainly do get out my message quite a bit. And I have a still a very healthy readership on my blog. Um, and then uh, Instagram came about and I started um, doing similar things on Instagram and also set up fiber retreats on Instagram. And then when we started creating the umbrella organization for all the regional men's knitting retreats, I started doing that out there as well. Um, and then I started setting up YouTube. I actually have a, a regular series of Knitting with Queer Joe um, that I haven't done one in a while uh, out on YouTube. And I also have done a number of tutorials. Um, one of the other things that I decided was needed in the, in the online knitting world was some way of trying to assess your, your skill level as a knitter. I constantly had people asking me, um, how do you know whether you're a beginner or an intermediate or advanced level knitter? And so I thought, well, that's a really interesting question. So I ended up compiling a, a database of, I think it's about 250 different skill sets associated with being a knitter, specifically a knitter. And, um, uh, and then created a, a self-assessment uh, survey that people could take and basically fill out it any way they wanted. And in essence, it would spit out what level of knitter you are. And I think there were eight different levels of knitting. I wonder whether there's an equivalent in the crochet world. And oh, yeah. if there isn't, I would like to see your survey and maybe um, um, work with you on creating one for the crochet world, because I think that's very valuable too for, I, for us. I would be thrilled to bits to, to help out with that. The, the hard part was like, I, I know so much about knitting having knit for over 35 years now. I, I know so much about it that um, that there were certain things that I knew to include and certain things I knew I didn't want to include in the in the piece. Like, like um, what's your familiarity with grafting, for instance, as opposed to Kitchener stitch specifically or that kind of stuff. And so I wanted to elicit a, a fair assessment. And the assessment is basically one of, I, I think it's five levels. You know, it's like... Um, I have no understanding of that at all. I don't even know what it is up to. I could do that without having to look up any reference or I could teach it. I could actually teach that, that technique type of thing. And mm. I think that was the, the highest level of expertise type of thing. And uh, it was really quite fascinating. To go so through. was it like a, an online quiz and then the scores would be tabulated? Oh, wow. And, and once it, it would, it would spit out a, a final assessment at the end of it. It's still out on, it's actually, I hosted it on the men's knitting retreat website and it's still out there. Um, I'll send you the link as part of the men's knitting retreat stuff uh, for the assessment tool. But, uh, but one of the things that was, you could also request uh, a detailed profile of how you kind of compared with other people 
in your, uh, so it had a, a scatter graph that showed everybody's um, years of, of uh, years of knitting versus the skill level point system, based on a point system uh, that you had. And it showed you exactly where you were in terms of, uh, you know, the red dot amongst all these other dots. So if you were 10 years of knitting and you were at this particular level, you were exactly average to the trend line and stuff. It was really kind of cool. And also maybe it, skills and stuff that you could add into your skill set. Yeah. Things that would bring you up to the next level. And stuff. I've, um, I've always considered most of my patterns um, beginner level, but I've been getting comments from testers that uh, they real some of them, especially some of the more recent ones, really are intermediate. So I, at least on the patterns, I'll, I will state, if I think they're intermediate, I'll, I will state it and I'll say why it uses these specific intermediate stitches, it requires math. You know, math scares people. <laughs> you Thank know, that. one of the things I never understood though is how can you say, like, and this is this is kind of, we when we came up with the consolidated list of all the different skill sets for knitting, for instance, we had to assess which ones of these are considered basic and beginner skills and which ones are considered intermediate skills. And obviously, you could you could some of them could go either way, and which mm -hmm. one goes obviously, um, and many of them could be in any of the categories. It, but then we also categorize them as the order in which you should learn. So if you were building a, a full skill set, this is the order in which we think that is most likely that you would learn. Now, obviously, that's not going to always be the case. You're going to you, a, a pattern might require that you understand how to graft something when we consider that an advanced technique, but as part of a beginner pattern. That's why I think whenever you write patterns, you shouldn't put skill level. You should put what are the skills necessary to accomplish this pattern. It's like if you can do a half double crochet, if you understand how to turn a corner without whatever, calculate the the number of stitches when turning a corner or determining how to keep it round or whatever, those are the kind of the, the skills that you need to. Mm -hmm. to yeah, that's 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 it. I like that idea too. Um, yeah, I might have to write out some thoughts on that and ask for people's feedback, um, and then I'll look at your survey too. Um, now, how and maybe how long go ahead. Crocheting. Sorry. How long have you been crocheting? As an adult, about five and a half years, I guess. So when you first started coming back into cr crochet, did you find that people, ha people have a higher expectation of patterns now than they used to? So, Well, I only learned a few very basic skills as a kid. Got it. Um, basically, it was just to hang out with my grandmother. Um, <laughs> so um, I don't even count that as crochet time. Although, you know, I knew some of those basic stitches. And so it's easy to get back into like single crochet, and double crochet, and, uh, and that sort of thing. And, and um, I was watching, uh, there are a lot of resources on YouTube for crochet, um, some of the men. Um, and um, so learning a lot. Um, so I don't really know what to compare it to. The, the thing that I was always surprised, when I first came into knitting, literally, you know, you'd be making a cardigan and it would say, make the back by casting on this many stitches, knit for this much in rib, and then knit the, knit, you know, 12 more inches, and then shape for the, the right side of the shoulder, you know, the armhole, and then do reverse shaping on the other side. And then for the front, do half the number of stitches, do the same number of rib, whatever. It was so simple and just like figure it out yourself type of thing whereas now it's like stitch over three from the last stitch on the left hand <laughs> you know it was like and, and then they reverse all their instructions for the you know the other side of the armhole shaping and i i think expectations have changed a lot or at least for knitting patterns People well i i it, i would compare it to like recipes from the wartime years they would if you were making a cake it would say you know um uh put in the 
usual amount of butter and sugar and flour and mix in the usual way. And, you know, there was the assumption that someone um, had grown up doing that. Usually uh, the woman of the house had grown up doing it beside her mother. So I think that in the early patterns you're talking about, there was that level of assumption that someone would have those kind of skills. And nowadays, so many people are picking up knitting and crocheting as a totally new skill that um, that level of detail is necessary. On the other hand, um, there are those who need to be told exactly how, to, how many to count or how many rows, or exactly how to do this. They have to be told, you know, chain one and turn, the chain one does not count as a stitch. Right. When does a chain one ever count as a stitch? But they have to be told, you know. Um, hey, I'm not a very good crocheter. I need to know <laughs> chain one doesn't count as a stitch, but anyway. But I, actually, I, 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 I have this fabric that was like, Torquing off to the right because idiot didn't know that chain one didn't make a stitch. <laughs> Honestly, one of my um, pro tips or um, um, you know tips for for I mean even I do them and I would call myself somewhere between um, intermediate and advanced. So if I'm doing a single crochet. Uh, rows and rows of single crochet, I use a stitch marker to, to differentiate between the actual first stitch and the chain. Ah. And so often that's really useful. And then if I'm doing a turning chain, like with double crochet or something, um, I always have to make sure that, that the uh, actual double crochet is every bit as tall as the chain is, or else the there's going to be a gap there. Mm. So, you know, little tips like that. And I um, always, when I, whenever I do something, actually, I, I should probably do another video on, on tips. Um, whenever I do uh, tips for crocheting, I say that the uh, home renovation shows, um, say, um, measure twice, cut once. Right. I say twice is not enough. You have to count like your life depends on it. And because, well, nearly all of the mistakes I ever make are about counting. Mm. And I think that's true for most people. I won't say it's the only mistake I've ever made, but um, yeah, so I think that's that's just me. Um, I'm, actually, that is an idea. I should do another um, tips. Um, because I've learned a lot since I've been basically crocheting every day for the past year and doing videos. And all that too. I always find those really useful, those kind of tips and stuff, especially from people that have done this so many times that they realize. Mm -hmm. well, there's some people that don't realize that, you know, this is how you calculate turning your corner on a granny square, or this is how you, you know, determine that some uh, circle is going to lay flat when you're crocheting a circle and uh, whatever, those kind of things, because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I could like run circles around most people when it comes to knitting, when I get into the crochet arena, if it's not relatively simplistic or very detailed instructions, I, I just can't do it. it, it I've tried, there have been a couple of times where I've tried crochet stuff from old time patterns type of thing. And I was just like, uh, I don't think I can do this. Stick with me. I'll learn you good. <laughs> Thanks. Um, actually, I have a bunch of hat patterns on my blog um, that you might want to look at and see if you can understand them. Thanks. So um, um, and if you want, I'll send you one of my crochet patterns um, from Ravelry. But um, what was I going to say next? More often, than, well, I don't do that many garments. Um, but when I do, I prefer to um, just say measure the. <laughs> it's funny. I. I did a, um, a, a, a clergy stole once because I have a, I went to I studied music so I have a lot of friends who went into church music and then went into the ministry so um, I thought oh I'll do clergy stoles none of them ever wore them but that's okay but um, um, so I looked at some other clergy stole patterns um, and the very 
first one I saw started out, measure your priest. For what, a coffin? Um, you know, a pair of pants? I don't know, anyway, so. Um, For grinder? <laughs> I'm sure the priest will have already taken care of that. I'll get in trouble for saying that, I'm sure, too. And now I've forgotten where I was going. Cut that part. <laughs> oh, but, but um, yeah, I go for, for measurements. Um, you know, oh, measure, measure a garment that already fits. You know, chest measurement, um, armhole to sleeve, that sort of thing. Or that, armhole to um, um, hem, um, that sort of thing. That's my favorite, when, especially when somebody asks me, someone who I care to knit for asks me to make them a garment. I say, find the similar garment with about the similar weight of fabric and measure, you know, from cuff to cuff and from, uh, you know, hem to, uh, to armpit and so on. Those kind of, I, I give them five measurements that I want. And uh, I, I can make that, you know, I, I, crochet, it's even easier to shape stuff into, you know, specific shapes. I think. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but, but even with knitting, I, I know how to do that. I can shape a garment so that it meets those measurements and uh, makes them happy. Yeah, yeah. Actually, it's it's. Uh, do you find? I have found this since I started doing my own designing and writing my own patterns. I get bored with other people's patterns. I even get bored with my own older patterns. I don't. Um, I, it, it's funny that you say that. Uh, the I, I sell this particular uh, scarf design. The uh, cross stitch scarf and um, not only do I sell the pattern but I sell probably I, I only do craft do craft shows a year and I probably sell about a dozen of those scarves every craft show that I do um, it's become my signature scarf and I love knitting them there there's certain patterns that that are broken up in such a way like like if i'm knitting a sock and it's it's basically either just stuck in that stitch you know it's just knitting uh, until i get to the ribbing and then it's just ribbing um i, I find myself like incented to keep going keep going type of thing i do because i'm a persistent mm -hmm. but uh mm -hmm. but this one it, patterns like this um I typically only try to publish patterns that I enjoy making. And when I say I enjoy making, I find myself like, oh my God, I've already gotten two repeats done. Wow, let's try a third. You know, it's like, it's almost self-perpetuating uh, when I enjoy it. And uh, I'm not a big fan of patterns that I'm like, oh, force yourself to do 10 more rows. And you know, it's like, that's yeah, not, I, I do exactly. But uh, they're not my favorite patterns. So, yeah. um, actually, um, um, you saw the tank that I did. I put it in on Instagram. Yeah. Um, uh, do you know Austin, um, Fashion Boy Austin? That's what I called him. You know which one I mean. Um, he helped me out a lot with giving me measurements from a tank top that he wears. Um, so, I mean, I, I had already told him I was going to do this and asked him if I sent it to him to remodel it for me. So that I could post pictures because I don't know that many people around here. I call him Austin. Awesome Austin. <laughs> well, that works too. That's but I'm making a second one now for Chris Hotta. Ah. Because he'll look just as good in it. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Well, so, one, of the, one of the things, there's a knitwear designer. Um, in fact, he was the first coordinator of the Midwest. It was called the Midwest Men's Knitting Retreat. Now it's called the Great Lakes Men's Knitting Retreat. But the first one ever was uh, coordinated by this guy. His name is Todd Gocken, G-O-C-K-E-N. And he also designs and has patterns out on Ravelry and published in various places and stuff. Um, but he used to have Stephen West model his uh, sweaters early on. In fact, I think that's how Stephen West got into knitting. Uh, 
but yeah, it's, uh, it's you could do worse for, for the crocheters, uh, only people. Stephen West is, uh, an amazingly prolific and well known, uh, network designer. Yeah, yeah. And he was a lot of horrible the younger guy. And so Todd, uh, he's he's very tall. He's Stephen West is six foot four, and mm. uh, and uh, tall. And uh, I didn't realize that he looks really petite in some of Todd Gawkins' sweaters. But uh, early on, so yeah. Cool, cool. Um, yeah. So um, anyway, he's been a model that nice, and I spoke to Chris about it too. And I'm gonna um, the other one. That I'm making for him is in this color. Wow. So, that's going to hmm? that's gonna be gorgeous. Yeah, it'll 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 be nice, especially on him. <laughs> but um, what was I going to say? Funny how Chris makes you lose your train of thought. There, I I have to say. There were of the 30 guys who were registered, 10 of them were new. One of them was Canadian, so he didn't come. So nine of the 29 guys were new, which is unusually large number of new people to mm -hmm. ever been at a retreat. Uh, one of the guys was there at the very first retreat in 2008 and had never been to another retreat since last month. And so he was almost new. So at any rate, the um, having so many new and so many just unbelievably attractive at that retreat. There were. It was it was really quite astonishing, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was fun. And you know, I I'd love to stay in touch with a lot of those guys. Um, and I have been in touch with uh, uh, several of them. So. Right. And I know um, at least one person said he's going to the Southeast retreat. Can't remember who it was. Bob Clark? I think so. Yeah. But Bob goes to a lot of the retreats. He's probably been to more retreats than I have. And he's only started going about five years ago, I think. And so uh, he's he goes to a lot of retreats. He's usually at the Midwest, at the Southeast, the Northeast, and uh, the Seattle retreats. And he might even go to Colorado, the Rocky Mountain retreat. I don't know. Where's the Rocky Mountain retreat held? In Denver? Near Denver? It's near Denver. It's in Estes Park, and uh, I think that's the town it's actually in. There's a, a beautiful kind of old log cabin lodge sort of uh, venue that they have in Estes Park. It's called Sunshine Mountain Lodge, and it's going to be mm. in uh, February. And so it's going to be February in Colorado. All right. <laughs> it takes a, a big desire, I think, for people to get to that one. Um. Wow, I have some friends that uh, are working at uh, UC Boulder. So, uh, I don't expect I'll have the money this year, but maybe some point in the future I'd love to. I, I do have to say, of all the retreats that I don't coordinate, that is probably my favorite one. And, oh, yeah? Yeah, I, I, Brady Robinder, who you didn't meet, he's often at the Northeast Retreat as well. Um, Brady and Frank used to coordinate that one, and Frank is kind of dropped out at this point Brady's taking it on himself and uh Brady's just the most amazing guy he is awesome in every way and the Sunshine Mountain Lodge is perfect space it's a small venue uh perfect space for a small intimate group of guys and um and the couple that lives there and cooks uh just does amazing food at the event it's it's one of my favorites beautiful beautiful area hiking is a big part of it like their road trips, instead of going to see a llama farm somewhere, they go out and hike, you know, some beautiful, beautiful area. So, mm. cool. Maybe I'll give it a try. The hills are bigger there. Just see. Uh oh. <laughs> Maybe not. Are there any <laughs> retreats on level ground? I Seattle, know. I imagine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. See, uh, Seattle actually is, uh, it's right on the sound, but the sound is kind of like raised up. Um, well, you don't go anywhere where it's hilly uh, from that one. The backyard of the nunnery, it's on an old nun oh. uh, habitat, uh, is uh, right, it borders directly on the, the sound there, and it's, it's really quite beautiful. That sounds cool, too. 
Um, people were talking about the Palm Springs retreat as well. That one's new. They, they've just decided to, uh, Doug Morris, who's come to the Northeast retreats for the last few years, um, had, thought it might be a great idea to bring men's knitting retreat to Palm Springs. Um, so he's doing that in April. Um, it's going to be slightly different though, because usually like, like when they have one in the Seattle area, all the guys from the Seattle area come to it. When they have one in Palm Springs, I don't think it's going to attract anyone from the Palm Springs area per se, unless they have like a commuter rate or something like that. So it's going to be interesting to see how that one fares, because mostly it's going to be a destination retreat as opposed to a locals retreat. And um, Interesting. Yeah, well, you notice like the New York retreat had a lot of people locally from the New York state area, um, as well as people from all around us too. But, yeah, but there were no day students there um, well like, in that area it would be hard hard Dave, to Dave Sladesky, like used to work at eastern mountain and so he lives very close there and he's there constantly and so he could have easily gone home at night if he cared to and stuff and just been a, a day tripper type of thing but he doesn't he, he prefers to stick around while we're there so which is great mm. well i see that we've been talking for an hour it doesn't seem like it because it passed very quickly and very pleasurably. Um, so um, before we um, close up, uh, would you like to uh, add anything? Anything else you'd like to say? Um, not that I can think of. The um, um, I'm very grateful when everybody, anybody ever takes interest in uh, the kinds of things that I'm working on. Uh, because normally I'm just like sitting behind a computer or, you know, at the actual retreat and stuff like that. So whenever people ask me about this, I turn into a complete gas bag. And so I appreciate the opportunity to get out my quota of words for the year. <laughs> well, I enjoy doing these because I, I think interview is a misnomer because of the, they're really all more conversation than, than interview. And, um, People tell me they like them, so that's good, too. Um, oh, another question came to me. I don't remember if, if you were talking about it. I know more than one person did. There, there seemed to be, like, online virtual um, men's knitting groups, like Zoom calls and that sort of thing. Do you Are you involved in any of those? Yeah. There's a, yes. Um, it, there's a twice a week on Tuesdays and Fridays from 12.30 to 3.30 every uh, Tuesday and Friday. There was a men's, men's only fiber Zoom meeting. Um, you can look up uh, men's fiber Zoom on Facebook. I, I can send you the link to that group as well. We announce it every day that we're on it there. Um, it's just a standard Zoom room. We usually get anywhere from six to 12 guys hanging out for three hours and chatting and knitting. And it's become a pretty regular group of guys. And, uh, and every once in a while, somebody new will show up. We've had people from Ireland, from New Zealand, from- Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, from Thailand, from, uh, no, not Thailand, sorry. He's from uh, the Philippines, um, California, all over the place. So it's kind of an interesting group of guys. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it, trust me, it used to be every day. I, I did it for a year, every day from 1230 to 3.30 uh, when COVID first started and it kind of saved my social life. Yeah, actually, uh, that's a large part of how I got into to doing YouTube. It's the community. Exactly. I, I you could tell almost by, uh, by your various YouTube uh, conversations and interviews. So yeah, I get that. Yeah, I am. Um, yeah. Um, okay, then. Um, well, I want to thank you for joining me. And I want to thank everybody who's been watching us the whole time. And like I always say, like, subscribe, comment, share all the standard YouTube crap, and keep coming back. And I'm going to click and record, but stay in the studio. Thanks. <laughs>